All right. Nope. Good afternoon and welcome to studio sessions with the New York chapter of the Recording Academy. My name is Shira Gans and I'm with the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. We're the city agency that supports all the creative industries that define New York, industries that represent 500,000 jobs and 150 billion in economic activity. I'm excited about today's mastering classes. These will be happening every June and Wednesday as part of New York Music Month which is another initiative of our office. Again, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. We have great in-person and virtual events happening all month. I'm gonna put the link to our website in the chat so you can check it out. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Maria and Jeff to talk to us about demystifying the mastering process. Hello. Good morning or I guess it's lunchtime for most of the world on the East Coast. Um, so, uh, hi everybody, I'm Maria Rice. I am a mastering engineer at Peerless Mastering. Um, it's actually located in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and Jeff and I are both members of the Recording Academy in the New York chapter. Um, so, I guess, Jeff, why don't you introduce yourself really quickly and then we can keep going. My name is Jeff Lipton. I founded Peerless Mastering in 1994, and um, Maria and I run this place together. Yep. Um, so we've been members of the Recording Academy for, I don't know, almost a decade or so. Um, I'm also a governor of, in the New York chapter, and um, Jeff and I have, I guess, you know, this kind of... Uh, you know, it's kind of the standard thing to everybody say, what are what are their awards? Jeff, how many Grammy nominations do you have? I have four Grammy nominations. <laughs> I have three um, for best uh, historical album. Um, so I'm thinking, Jeff, why don't you talk about how you started and into in this mastering business? And FYI, I'm going to be asking questions as if I don't know anything about mastering. So, uh, well, I started um, I started mastering before I actually knew what mastering was. I used to. 
go to concerts in the 80s and I would um, record to cassette tapes, um, live, to, live to two track cassettes. And um, I would bring these recordings home and they sounded terrible. And I would, I would use some equal, EQ on them to try to make them sound better. Um, and eventually that turned into something where I bought, um, I bought an early DAW called Sound Designer 2 which was a four track DAW that eventually, um, the code eventually made it into Pro Tools. And um, I used to use that, I used to record concerts to DAT and then sort of master them in, in Sound Designer too and give them back to the band. And um, one band was so impressed, one guy, his name was Robert Fisher, he handed me four DATs one day at a show and he said, master these. And these were um, two albums that he recorded at professional studios in Boston. Nice. How long did it take you to record those, your, your first like professional project? To do my first mastering job, I spent six months on it working about 20 hours a day. Yeah, that's really, you know, that's not extreme at all. No, no, I never do anything extreme. <laughs> um, oh, and, and to that point, just FYI, Jeff is sitting in our lounge right now with the Christmas lights behind us. Um, normally we would be in the studio, but... Uh, we have text tuning the mastering room today. So, um, and I am in the B room, which is our second room, um, which is where we've done a lot of our analog restorations for these historical projects. Um, I'm actually, you know, I'm actually surrounded by, by source material right now. Um, it comes in any format from like 45s to DAT, as Jeff mentioned. Um, also, like some of our most well-known um, box sets have been mastered from cassette tape sources. And and Jeff, like, what is what do you think about the process of pulling all these different, you know, all these different formats together? And how do you make them sound? Or how do we make them sound like a cohesive record? Well, it's super fun because um, if you have source tapes that vary as much as like cassette tapes, which sound really bad and don't have a very good frequency range to um, reel to reel tape, which um, sounds usually sounds amazing. Um, it's really fun to try to make something that sounds really bad sound sound on par with something that is um, professionally or really well done. Um, or just make them work so that when you're listening, the change isn't as huge as it as it would be without mastering. Right. And I know for my part, I do a lot of digital restoration for these historical formats and just pulling out, um, you know, some, you know, tape noise and, and, and record noise and, 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 you know, not completely removing like sort of the layers of history, but, you know, also just making it clear for the listener um, and hopefully making the recordings shine as they did originally. But um, well, let's talk about just like not historical recordings. Um, <laughs> when somebody asks, when someone calls and says, what is mastering? What, what, do, you, what do you tell them? Mastering is the final creative phase of the music recording process. Um, it's the last chance you have to make your song sound as good as they possibly can. It's also the first time usually when an engineer, when an engineer is thinking about the album as a cohesive piece of art. So our job is to put the songs together and make them work together cohesively as a, as a single album. And um, yeah, we, so we, we basically are the last um, people that shape, shape the sound in the process. Yeah, so so basically what what's the deliverable um, at the end of this process? What do we give back to the client? I mean, it depends. Nowadays some um, clients want um, different formats. Um, normally clients end up with um, high, high resolution wave files or and CD resolution wave files are the typical deliverables. But we also sometimes have to um, create, we also sometimes create 48K sample rate um, masters for video. And um, and if we're mastering in Atmos, it's a .ADM BWF file. 
Nice. Um, so what should a, what should someone expect from mastering? They have this mix and they've been listening to it. What are they expecting to change, if anything? Well, um, it depends on what the it depends on what the source material sounds like. I mean, if it's a if it's a, an amazing mix done by you know a masterful mix engineer like say Bob Clear Mountain or Michael Brower, um, you almost do nothing to it. You just <laughs> you do the absolute minimum. In in every case, you do the absolute minimum you have to to any mix to make it sound the best it can. Because any change you make in mastering has the intended effect and it has unintended effects because we're not working with individual tracks. We're working with just the left and the right channel if we're mastering in stereo. And any change you make in any frequency range will affect the instrument you're trying to affect as well as anything else that happens to be in that frequency range. So like, how would, how would somebody know that their mix is, is ready for mastering? Um, the thing I would say is if you're happy with your mix, if you like listening to your mix on different, uh, you've listened to your mix on different stereos, you, you've put time into where the, um, to having the space and um, the clarity that you like in your mix, th that's a good place to start. Um, also, we always, we always offer free mix critiques before mastering if someone wants that, if they're unsure about whether the mix is ready for mastering. And um, that's a pretty helpful. That's a pretty helpful way to um, go about the process. Um, yeah. What else? Like, I guess. I mean, we do. Do we ever like re reject mixes at that point? I, you know, I. You know. I mean, I, I have I've rejected mixes before, or I've, or I've asked artists. I say, are you sure you want to go forward with these mixes? If you and give them a list of changes they could make that would make the projects better and then I leave it up to the artist if they want to make those changes or if they you know it's obviously their creative decision um I'll work with whatever whatever they send me but you know if I if I come back with feedback saying these mixes will never sound that great and but if you make these few changes they could sound really wonderful in the mastering process and they say no I don't want to make those changes then we'll just work with what they send us Mm. What are you, what are you listening for? What am I listening for? Um, well, I'm listening for um, mixes that are already really slammed and um, very compressed and very loud. Typically, don't sound as clear as mixes that are not very not limited very much and <laughs> and have no digital dis distortion. I mean, a lot of times the biggest problems I hear in um, mixes people send me is you can hear digital distortion and clipping from either tracking or um, in the mix process. A lot of times people aren't checking to make sure that plugins aren't um, clipping while they're using them and they're putting something on the master bus that hides the clipping that's occurring in the mix bus. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, how will uh, making, making the music loud kind of affect its quality? Well, um, you know, I mean, a lot, a lot of times in mastering, we're asked to make things loud ourselves, but we've really, we've really refined that practice a lot. And people that are doing, people that are not, are new to doing that themselves typically are using a game structure that does, that's not very good. That usually causes digital, distor digital distortion. And um, once you have digital distortion introduced, there's no easy way to get rid of it. I mean, if anyone can get rid of it, you can, Maria, but um, it's it's better to start with a product that doesn't have as many defects to begin with, you know? Right, yeah, it all starts at the source. Yes. Um, so I thinking, let's like go through like the process of mastering. I, I would think the first thing would be, I guess the mix, mix critique, um, but then also, you know, I guess feedback and, and communication with the client about the vision. I typically do a video call with every client before we start working together to just discuss their sonic goals and discuss what they're hoping to accomplish and talk about what can be accomplished. Um, and um, 
that's really, it's really helpful. I usually end up taking a page or two of notes, talking to every client and, you know, just, just knowing their personalities and, and hearing the things that they respond to typically affects the way I work and, um, and will affect their end product because I want to make it as, as personalized as possible for every client. That sounds good. Um, so I guess most people kind of want to know what is what are the processes and 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 later I think when Jalen comes on um, I'll you know demonstrate these um, more you know more viscerally but Jeff like what what's your process what what are we focusing on? Okay, well the first thing I do when I get a new project as I listen to it from start to finish. And um, while, I'm, while I'm doing it, I'm either making actual notes or mental notes of what's, of what's, um, what's the, what should be the same between songs and isn't, what is the same between songs and that should be, and um, what the differences between songs are. Because um, part of mastering is if, a, if say the bass in one song should sound similar to the bass in the next song, like the way it's played, um, we'd want to make it, we'd want to make that even. But say one song is, you know, just has an acoustic guitar and then the next song has a ton of like actual bass or um, electronic bass. Um, obviously the differences between those should be kept and, you know, we're not going to try to add bass to a song that doesn't really have bass or, you know, something like that. We, you want to maintain the integrity of the, you know, the artist of what the artist is going for. And, right. and, and thinking about what they're going for when listening through everything is a huge part of the process. Okay, so breaking it down, I think, in chunks would probably be helpful for some people. So as far as, you know, what is our, what does the chain look, generally look like, or at least the one you're using, which I normally use, but everyone has a different process but let's hear your process <laughs> well i mean okay so after listening to after listening through the album and coming up with it, i choose a song that's representative of the, if there is such a song um and i usually start working on that one song and i have a vision in my head for how, where the project what the project should sound like what the song should sound like and so i um i typically the first thing i typically do is is um run it through some analog EQs and, um, and and adjust based on what I was hearing. A typical mastering adjustment is between 0.1 and 1 dB, and even 1 dB isn't this, isn't always that common. Like in mastering, just a little bit goes a long way. And um, so once I start just like fine tuning the song, I'll start playing with different if there's compression if compression is needed whatever compressions needed and whatever limiting is starting, whatever limiting the song responds well to. Nice. So it's a lot of accumulated small changes. Really? Yes. It's a lot of small changes. And then when I'm, once I've gotten into the song, I typically start removing things from the chain to double check that they're absolutely needed in the chain. Um, and I'm constantly adding and then removing and then, or making a big change and then lowering it down. Like I'll make like a 1.5 dB change and lower it down to um, one dB or a half dB to see if that sounds better or out if that sounds better. Um, it's just a constant going through and second guessing everything I do constantly. Right. So yeah, I mean, less is definitely more like if it's not broke, don't fix it. If it's, exactly. Yeah. And, and if I can't decide if something sounds better in or out, it's always out. Right. Um, if somebody wanted to understand what exactly is happening when compression, when we're applying compression, like how do you normally explain that? Um, well, the way I explain it, I don't know if it's awesome, but um, you know, basically compression is um, once the once the attack time is re is reached, the compressor pushes down the waveform. Um, until the release time comes up. <laughs> I mean, it's for, okay. So basically, if you have a wave that goes like this, you could you can make the wave smaller. You push the wave. You can push the wave, <laughs> compress it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's that's a very um, yeah, 
I mean, that's that's a very like, yeah, data oriented way to describe. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I I kind of like. I, yeah, I have to describe it a lot to like people like my parents and I'm, I've never described it in a way they can understand. Yeah, I mean, yeah, basically like, yeah, I think more visually or I guess more, I'm like feeling it, I guess. And, and, and compression is, you know, you, well, ideally sometimes you take sort of the quieter parts and bring them up. Um, or, you know, if you might have some, it's basically about in mass, at the mastering stage, it's about sort of, gaining some presence and 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 I guess getting the level that we want with the the amount of headroom that we have because we are limited by by digital audio um and so that means things like you know a lot of sub bass a lot of you know 30 hertz kind of stuff that could take up a lot of space and 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 make it hard for you know people to get their music to a more I guess commercial volume um but also, you know, it's also used as sort of a glue, right? Um, you know, compressors can be sort of an instrument. At the mastering stage, you try not to to be so heavy-handed at that point, but it does, it can be very musical. Um, so yeah, I mean, go, go what's, what, what people use in, in mixing, like, or, you know, on a single track, like, they would say two-to-one compression is is pretty light. You know, some people are using, you know, three to one, five to one, you know, compression. In mastering, you typically, you're often using, like, say, 1.2 to one or, or 1.5 to one um, ratios. And they will have a big effect because they're affecting every single thing in the mix. And um, you, in mastering, you really try to be, you just try not to be very heavy handed. What's your opinion of multiband compression? <laughs> multiband compression is a is a valuable tool when something I think is is pretty broken. Um, if you get a well, if you're restoring um, a mix off of a cassette tape, um, and the cassette and the cassette tape is just the frequency range is very limited and there's spiky things happening, multiband compression would be a really good way to bring it in line and make it sound more at par with um, the professional mix or the the better sounding mixes that we're matching it to on like say a, an album where it's mostly recorded well and then there's some bonus tracks that come off cassettes. Um, I think multiband compression is really good when something is broken and needs to be fixed. Um, but when it comes to something that sounds, that comes in sounding really good, I think it's too destructive typically and will not yield the, will will change the mix too much in ways that, um, will destroy the integrity of what the engineer, the mix engineer accomplished. Yeah. So basically more of a remedial tool. Yeah, Yeah. I found, yeah, I found that, yeah, sometimes it can sound really good in the moment and then later... You're like, wait, what happened to that snare? What happened to that, yeah, attack on that hi hat? Um, so I think maybe people will probably want to see what the studio looks like. I think I'll share some pictures um, as we wait for Jalen to come online, um, and then I'm going to share. Uh, we're going to do some critical listening of uh, his mix and the master I did of it. Uh, last night at two in the morning. Um, that's how it goes around here. <laughs> and, um, and I'll show you, you know, exactly what I used. Uh, most of it was outboard gear. So it, again, it will be a story in pictures. But yeah, let's see. Um, I am going to just share some pictures of the studio because we cannot be in the studio at this time. Well, I'm in, but let's see. Mm-mm-mm. All right. Well, here's a quick video of when I was uh, recording files last night. <laughs> I just, it's my attempt at a cinematic sweep. Give me all your digits. They said I'm so clean, but I ain't even washed the dishes. The flyers, nigga. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I'm really all on my pitching. I heard you just got paid. Nigga, come and give me your pitching. I ain't need my money. I ain't need my money. Fuck it, show it ain't funny. Fuck it, show it ain't. I ain't need my money. 
my money. I need my money. Look at y'all, it ain't funny. Look at y'all, it ain't. I need my money. I need my money. Look at y'all, it ain't funny. Look at y'all, it ain't. I need my. So that is um. That was just basically uh, my world uh, as of last night, um, and I was working on the mix that we'll be hearing today. Um, so as you can kind of see, it's it's kind of a the A room is kind of akin to the bridge of a, a spaceship. Um, so on the left we have uh, several banks of dynamics processors, um, compressors. Um, a lot of most of them are used in parallel, which means um, we we kind of mix and sprinkle uh, a little bit from each unit uh, to to create the right blend that is the least intrusive or damaging to the music. Um, really depends on the program material. Um, and as Jeff said, like a lot of times, um, you know, if we can bypass it, we bypass it. Uh, you know, the goal is not to radically change, you know, what's been presented to us. Um, so yeah, yeah. And then on the, on the right side, uh, this is our banks of EQs. Um, we have some analog and digital ones. Um, I think my favorite one is is the Weiss um, EQ one. It's really surgical. Um, you can also use it in mid side mode, um, but uh, lately I have not really been using it in that mode. Again, trying to be as, as unobtrusive as possible. Uh, down at the bottom we have um, our some uh, one a couple of our converters, um, analog to digital, digital analog converters. Um, the gold one on the right is the Lavery Gold, um, and it's also connected to uh, Antelope Isochrome Atomic Clock, which keeps time digital time for the whole studio, so things don't get out of sync. Um, it's kind of cool. It has a radioactive um, isotope in in, in it. Uh, so that's how we keep atomic time and actually on top is a cool on top of that on the right um, is is a cool piece of gear um, it's it's kind of a it's more like a an amplifier that we use for lift um, it's called the white stone and it's it's a piece of boutique gear um, that was created by my friend Kim Rosen and her husband. So, uh, let's see. Shh. What's atomic time? Um, it's, I guess it's just basically the most accurate way of, of, of keeping time. So when you have all of these digital signals everywhere, it's, it's very, um, you might have already experienced it in your own, you know, stuff at home. You know, it one blip in the in the chain could, you know, create audio to get out of sync or create like very slight distortions, um, and that's what affects the quality. So here, you know, especially at the mastering stage, the focus is on quality here and and purity of sound. So even the power uh, is here is you know highly conditioned. Um, and, the, you know, the rooms are, are acoustically treated um, to the most, you know, accurate perfection. Actually, that's why I'm not in the A-Roo right now, because we have acoustics in there tuning for Atmos, so, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, let's, I'm still waiting for Jalen to show up, but, you know, I see some questions in the chat. Um, so actually this is pretty relevant. Is mastering a single always necessary? Um, yeah, that's a good question because I know Jeff was talking about how, you know, one important thing that we do is taking a lot of disparate mixes and making them fit cohesively in a, in a whole, in a whole album, right? You have some that are lighter, some are darker, some that were recorded really, really loud and some, you know, that are soft and, you know, just trying to level those uh, between. But if you have a single, um, actually, that's really relevant because you were, you're going to hear uh, kind of the difference. So usually when you're, when you're mixing, uh, you know, the result is not the same as what you're going to end up hearing, um, you know, out in the world on, on Spotify and, and Apple Music. 
um, you know, it's we still apply we still apply the the dynamics processing and some EQ tweaks to really make it translate um, in other in every almost every listening environment uh, that is imaginable. So you know, it's 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 one thing to hear a mix like in your house, in your studio, or in your car, um, and then it's another thing to hear it in a you know in an acoustically treated room or a couple of rooms actually listen to them in these two different rooms and and compare so yeah um i also see a question about uh if a musician has hearing or auditory processing issues should they avoid mixing and mastering well, that's actually a really good question also um because one of the th reasons why mastering exists or and why you people will hire a different person to do it is is for the objectivity and that is relevant like whether you have perfect hearing or not um, everybody could always use a second ear, a second or third uh, ear on the project um, especially you know if you are involved in writing or producing um, you know there's a lot of things that you're listening for that at the mastering stage you probably aren't listening for that we're paying attention to um, you know I'll notice you know, clients will be you know paying more attention to like musical aspects of or songwriting or, or just all these or like whatever whatever food they were eating when they were recording this piano part and um, and at, at this point we're listening for consistency we're listening for the tone we're listening for uh, the dynamic range and anything that upsets the balance Oh, hey, it's Jalen. Um, but but to to close that point, um, I I feel like you probably if I think don't quote me on this. Everyone hears a little bit differently, and you know the bra human brain is really uh, is really impressive and and what it can do to compensate. But if you're mixing and and or mastering and you have uh, you know hearing issues, it's definitely it's it's definitely key to to you know bring your mix to people that you can trust and um, you know and maybe have some some meters you can rely on but don't rely on the meters too much. Um, so hey, Jalen, how are you going? It's going pretty good. How are you? How are you doing? I'm like I'm doing the thing. So are you ready to hear this? Are you ready to hear this 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 work I did last night? Let's get this work. I got the text at 5 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm going to share. So I'm going to share a couple other things real quick. Um, so I just showed them a little video of, of the studio and what was what was going on. Uh, I guess I have to share the desktop, which is really annoying. But so I will just show. Can everyone see this picture of the DAW? This is Sadie that we're working in. Um, so this is basically what I was looking at when I was working on this project. Um, I have the original mix uh, and then a channel where all the where we record. Um, and then underneath the, the yellow waveforms are different clips of other songs that I was kind of using for reference. Um, and it, and references are important, especially if you don't have, if you're using headphones or if, you, if you're not mixing in a, a room that's consistent that you, that you know very well. Um, a reference is what keeps, lets you know, like, what ballpark are we in? Um, so these songs underneath were already mastered um, elsewhere. And it just, it's not that I was matching them, but it was more to snow. Am, is this, where am I in this? Is it louder, softer, brighter, warmer? All right. All right, here's the moment you've all been waiting for. Also, I haven't listened to this since last night at five in the morning, so. <laughs> all right. Um, should we listen to the original mix first? Yeah, let's do that. So, Jalen, you wanna say anything? You have any words about your process or, you know, about the about the artist and his vision. Sure. Um, in this case, I I both produced and mixed the song, so 
uh, Rodney and I were working on this originally over quarantine. So there were some sessions that were done asynchronously. Um, Rodney's image is very like, whenever I'm producing and mixing for an artist, I like to get a feel for what their vision is. Like, is that the classic five whys question where you ask why this, then why that? And you drill down to the actual goal. And with Rodney, the thing that his true why um, was that he wanted to make something that sounded distinct and also very shiny, if that made sense. So that was where all the mixing and uh, production decisions went. Things that were brash and shiny, but also still had that, um, also still had kind of a, a bit of a conventional appeal too. So that's all from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when you told me um, sh the part about shiny, I was, I was mulling it over last night. I'm like, what does he mean by shiny? I'm thinking maybe kind of bright or maybe in your face. I what other words do you have for shiny? No, the reason it's so general is because Lily, like chrome is not a color. It's mm -hmm. like a quality. So yeah. things that are that have some sort of polish, whether it's if it if it's in a direction, it commits to that direction to the point where it's like it sounds polished. Uh I use shiny just because all the imagery actually is physically shiny. So I actually think that's great. That's a really when you said shiny, that was that was all those other words you said afterwards were, were kind of the impression that I had as well. And that's, and you know, as we were talking about earlier with Jeff, like having like this talk is like crucial in the mastering process because otherwise it could go off and I could have made it in a non shiny direction. It could have gone really grimy with it. Um, all right, I'm going to play this. Uh, I'm going to play like pieces of it just to save time. Um, and let me know if you can't hear anything. Diamonds on my necklace, yeah. You bitches so late, your new name yesterday. Push my buttons, ooh, yeah, right there. That's yeah. how I activate, aggravate. Step on your neck and I'll snap your vertebrae. On delay, you niggas is lagging, you really on delay. First things first, I'll put you in a hearse if I reach in my purse. Mm -hmm. Make a nigga burst if I pull up my skirt, he just wanna come taste it. Mm -hmm. Got a bad bitch in ATL, light skin, red bone, she look like no, no. Hit you in the back with a bat, look at that. Oops, I made a bull, bull. Good fella, bring your umbrella, make it rain down. Thank Tell her, pull her all the chatter that you change sound Work better when you under pressure, make them go wild It's my money and I need it now Good fella, bring your um Okay, so that was uh, the Unmastered Mix, which already sounds great uh, Jalen, I remember you saying that there was that, you know, sort of the hi-hat ticking percussive sound was, was the piece that was... Um, the piece that needed to remain intact, basically. Um, so yeah, a lot of times when I'm mastering, I like to think of something usually like the snare um, as like an anchor. So when you start changing things uh, with dynamics processing and even an EQ, um, you know, it's also kind of a barometer of like, okay, how how much is this being affected? How how much squish is happening? All right, um, I'm just going to switch over to, so I, I bounced two versions. One is a little more reserved. The other one is a little more, like I went for it. So <laughs> uh, let's go with that one, the shiny one. Um, here we go. Diamonds on my necklace, yeah. You bitches so late, your new name yesterday. Push my buttons, ooh, yeah, right there. That's how I activate, aggravate. Step on your neck and I'll snap your vertebrae. On delay, you niggas is lagging, you really on delay. First things first, I'll put you in a hearse if I reach in my purse. Mm -hmm. Make a nigga burst if I pull up my skirt, he just wanna come taste it. Mm -hmm. Got a bad bitch in ATL, light skin, red bone, she look like no, no. Get you in the back with a bat, look at that. Oops, I made a bull, bull. Good fella, bring your umbrella, make your brain down. Thank Tell her, pull her all the chatter that you change sound Work better when you under pressure, make them go wild It's my money and I need it now Good fella, bring your umbrella Okay, so just to A, B Make your brain down I knew I was going to do that Work better when you under pressure, make them go wild 
It's my money and oh wow It's my money and I Making bitches scream louder than Jennifer Hudson Shitting on niggas, my bad I fuck face this an alien abduction You niggas not seeing me, damn I'm starting to think I'm Russian Blah, 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 uh Who the fuck you think you are? I'll run you over him, I'll fuck you think you are I'll run you over him, i rover You a stepping stool for my car I put the tame into your Impala Put you in the desert with no water Only fucking with a water I'll put a halo on your head I forgot my meds Going psycho Strap me in the bed Doctor said ready Hit me in the bed Doctor said ready Here's the needle Eating so much bread I need Jenny Craig What about lipo? Slice a nigga top in half Yeah I'm good Okay uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot here Jalen Like What's What, what changed <laughs> For you The volume um, <laughs> well, besides, Yeah things yeah, are yeah, together Much better I um, yeah, I should probably volume match, but yes, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, um, the big issue I had with my own mix was, and this is where, you know, when you're mixing for an artist, you are at the mercy of the client. Uh, Rodney really likes that hi hat really high. I have tinnitus, so that was bothering me the whole time. So matching the levels to meet uh, that, that hi hat was a big priority for me just from my own listening and it was met so that was the first thing i heard i was like ah everything is glued together and it matches all nicely so and then it's also like it leans into that it leans into that direction where it's just like in your face it's just like has that spit shine polish yeah um i was gonna say thanks but also like uh this isn't about me so um <laughs> Um, so yeah, uh, that glue came from, you know, some dynamics processing. I am, you know, just to illustrate, I have two versions, um, that were also captured, um, at different points in the mastering chain. So I actually haven't heard any of these before the thing, but, um, so this version I'm playing right now, audio five, it is pre-upward compression. So... This would be the quietest version. Um, so this would basically only be EQ changes we're hearing, uh, in theory. So. I reach in my purse, mm -hmm. Make a nigga burst if I pull up my skirt, he just wanna come taste it, mm -hmm. Got a bad bitch in ATL, light skin, red bone, she look like no, no. Hit you in the back with a bat, look at that. Okay, Oops, um... I made a bull, bull. Shut up, the cha-ching sound. Work better when you under pressure, make them go wild. It's my money, and I need it now. You under pressure, make them go wild. It's my money, and I need it now. Good fella, bring your umbrella. Make up when you under pressure, make them go wild. So it's a little, um, it's a little tricky to listen to because, you know, I actually turned your mix down a little bit first before, um, beginning work, uh, just so I had more, more room to, to perform all this crazy stuff. Um, so I'm going to share, I have to share, I hate that I have to share my desktop to show you pictures, but, oh, here we go. Um, here's one piece of the process. Um, this is the aforementioned white stone, um, and our, and our atomic clock. Uh, EQ wise, uh, this, these are the exact settings actually that were used. I just took them, uh, while I was bouncing last night. Um, so at the top, uh, analog EQ by GML. Um, as Jeff mentioned before, uh, we rarely make changes bigger than a dB. Um, it's, but you see there's like an accumulated effect um, of all these different, all these different changes. Um, we have, you know, a little bump around like 50 hertz at the low end. I added, it, actually, it's a little darker than um, what was submitted. Uh, I added more warmth, um, more stuff in the lower mid-range. Uh, you can see around 270. I don't want to bore people with numbers. Um, and also, uh, you'll see interspersed a lot of bumps around 2K, 25 hertz, or 2,500 hertz. Um, and that is to bring out some presence in the vocal. But obviously we don't want it to be shrill and that's where that's the line that get, gets walked um i also add a you know bit of air around like 20 hertz you'll see that um in the yceq 
uh, I basically just devoted this to sort of a surgical base bump. Um, so, Jayla, you probably know about the whole thing with the harmonic series, right? And so, you know, so the, a lot of the base material was coming in around like, I know I'm going to wrap this up so we can do more Q&A, but like coming in around like 30 hertz. And that was, you know, it's kind of a, a range that most humans are not going to hear, or especially if they're listening on, um, you know, on AirPods and whatnot. But it also takes up a lot of headroom um, and, and makes it so it's difficult to, to mani manipulate the volume for more presence. Um, so, so I did reduce around that big frequency around 34 but because harmonic series I uh, I bumped it around I doubled it bumped it around 69 and then another bump at 138 um, and then I started and so like in theory I did that and it sounded fine and then I just started using my ears and <laughs> that sounded better <laughs> um, yeah uh, let's listen to this is the return analog version. This is everything. This is pretty much all of the treatment before it hits uh, the plugins, which. But yeah, right there, that's how I activate, aggravate. Step on your neck and I'll. First, I'll put you in a hearse if I reach in my purse. Mm -hmm. Make a nigga burst. Really on delay. First things first, I'll put you in a hearse if I reach in my purse. Mm -hmm. Make a nigga burst if I pull on no. Hit you in the back with a bat. Look at that. So what we're listening for here is like, again, more, more presence in the vocal. Um, a little more bump in the bass, but the the tone is a little different. No, no, hit you in the back with a bat. Look at that. Oops, like no, no, hit you in the back with a bat. Look at that. Oops, I made a bull bull. Good tell a pull up all the chat. Um. So yeah, and then we apply the finishing touches, which is making it loud. Work better when you under pressure. Make them go wild. It's my money. So yeah. Um. I think it's time to take some questions. Yeah. Hmm. Let's see. So Finn wants to know if an artist sends a mix for critique, are they committing to getting it mastered? That's going to depend on the studio. Uh, but just being frank, you know, most engineers are probably going to, you know, prioritize uh, critiquing your mix um, if it's something that they're going to work on, but they're not, not committing. Um, also, you can submit a mix and then get feedback on it and then be like, all right, cool, I'll come back. I'll come back at you, you know, next year whenever it's ready. So, again, all power to the client there. Um, so... As a mastering beginner, what are the most important things to know? Hmm. Kaylin, I want you to chime in with me too, because you kind of have... You went to school. Come on. <laughs> um, I, I will say, for my part, it has to be... To, it's the critical listening is, is, is really the big part. Um, you know... Everyone kind of starts with being like, oh, you know, how do I, like, what settings do you use? Like, what's the best gear? What are the best plugins? Um, and that's all well and good. Oh, by the way, these, can you see this? This plugin? There's stripes on my screen. Stripes? Yeah. Ugh, okay. Um, I was sharing my, my screenshot of the plugins. But, yeah. So here it is. No, that's not it. Here it is. You know, every, yeah, we do everything. It goes outboard. We have this analog chain, but like, don't tell Jeff I showed you, but yes, we do use ozone stuff. Sometimes. <laughs> um, but the thing with this, and it's also why it takes, it took hours to master one song, um, is that especially with the isotope things, you can make a lot of changes that you didn't intend in a lot of different effects which is also why um you know it's so important to a b and go back and forth and leave the room and listen to some other music and come back and then be like okay that just 
So, um, you know, when I use it, it's, it's generally very sparing, but this does add some of that glue uh, at the end. Um, my process was to get everything as close to how I wanted it out before it hit the plugins. Um, and and this, these, this process, um, you know, plugins are great after at this stage because if I had tried, attempted to do a lot of this gluing stuff out, outboard or getting that volume, uh, it probably might have, it, it would have created like distortion or those kinds of things. So these are like, these are the compromises and balances we make. So, I mean, I guess the most important things uh, for me, if you're, if you're starting out is learn to listen, critical listening, and just understand the concept of balance. Cause it's basically all it is to me is balance. And where, where what is the aesthetic, you know, what is the music trying to tell you it wants to sound like? <laughs> if I can jump in also, uh, learn your tools, if that makes sense. Like don't stick to, don't run out and get a bunch of things, whatever your stock EQs, whatever your stock compressor is, learn how that works, what that does. The analogy that was given to me when I started school, um, going to NYU was imagine you have a toolbox and you need to build it and you need to build a table. Are you going to immediately reach for the power drill if you don't already have a power drill or are you going to go reach for a hammer, a screwdriver and some nails? You need that table done as soon as possible. So figure out how to use those tools you have and then get to the results you need. And then further on, be like, oh, you know what would have been really easy if, if I had a power drill to do that part that I was doing by hand. So. Yeah, it's that's a good I never thought about the power drill um, analogy. <laughs> um, so. An anonymous attendee wants to know if, a, if someone is an acoustic singer or songwriter recording on a program such as GarageBand, um, but wants to have their music played on, on the radio, how do they know how, what, to, what to do to master in a way that would be acceptable to radio-ready production? Can built-in mastering programs do the job as opposed to a professional mastering company? Well, you already know what my answer is going to be. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I actually, if we if this was like a two hour or three hour session, um, we were gonna do an experiment where I actually mastered the same track in Logic using native plugins. Um, I actually used to teach um, at Point Blank Music School and and I've done some other uh, mastering workshops and basically, you know, the standard in school is just so it's democratic is that everyone has to use native plugins, um, the same DAW that is very accessible, such as Logic or Ableton. Um, and you know what? You, you get really good results. It's really about the listening. And you know, you probably, I would say the best piece of gear to invest in would be your, your headphones. Um, if you're, if you're gonna, if you're going bare bones, would you agree? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Is that basically what you work on or do you have like monitors in your place? I do. I have, you know, Rocket 5s, right? The uh, the EDM standard, as I've heard it called. Those <laughs> lovely yellow cones. But yeah, um, I switch between, I think there's a, another question that's something like, uh, how do you check that your mix sounds the same in headphones versus in speakers? Um, the standard that I learned was that uh, speakers are better at reproducing mid and high end and headphones low and mid and low and mid range frequencies. So when I'm mixing, I actually have a, I actually have, um, I'm using Ableton for most of my stuff now. So I actually have a little Ableton rack that is just the mid range and it's monoed. And for a large period of time, I will just be inside of that mono only mid range mix. And then towards the end, all right, now expand and see what I have. I'm not able to see 250 Hertz and below. And then what I am able to see or what I'm what I haven't been able to see 10k hertz and above and then you find that the amount of edits you need to do lowers dramatically that's a cool way of breaking it down um yeah I also found one cool thing about you know a lot of plugins now like the fab filter and isotope stuff is that you can sort of solo the things that are being affected which was not a thing you could do with you know a thirty thousand dollar compressor <laughs> Go figure. 
Uh, someone did have a question. Is is uh, is this stuff really expensive? Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so the software that we're using is, um, and everybody is different. Uh, Sadie, uh, which is a boutique company out of the UK, and uh, it kind of comes with its own computer unit and all this other stuff. It's again, that's kind of a like thirty thousand just for our um, restoration plugins, which which we use to take out, um, you know, it's kind of the top standard, taking out noises and stuff like that. Uh, but other people use different DAWs. People use, I don't know, Reaper, or you could use Logic, as I said, um, all kinds of things. Uh, and each piece of gear is pretty pricey, um, probably, yeah, yeah. Every, everything's you know between between six and six thousand is like the cheapest thing uh, 30 goes up for our, like our converters and that sort of thing um but yeah it's 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 really about quality quality of sound and if that if you can achieve that with whatever you have then that's that's what matters um you know at the end of the day it's like well, what's coming out of the speakers what are people hearing when they, you know, open Apple Music, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> Shout out to Reaper. All right, cool. So Finn also wants to know what to look for when choosing a mixing mastering engineer. Um, first of all, let's not have mixing and mastering be the same person, right? So, I mean, Jalen, what if you mastered this thing by yourself? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think it would have gone as well. I honestly, I can, like, I think of music uh, in the whole recording process, kind of like a basketball team, where it's like, I think of the producers like a point guard who's like the smallest guy who kind of has to run around and run the offense. Pardon, I'm sorry for all the people who don't watch basketball here. Um, no Celtics. Celtics. Sorry. <laughs> ah, I'm a Warriors fan. You know this. No. I actually. <laughs> I I'm a Warriors have... fan. Why? <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. I'm indoctrinated. I'm in Boston. Ah. I actually, yeah, honestly, could care less. Anyway, continue. Okay, but yeah, so um, I think of the mixing engineer kind of like as a like a shooting guard who's def who's like a defensive person and can, you know stop the stop all the bad things from happening and then a mastering engineer is like a center who you know they're un they're the unsung hero ideally if your team is good you don't have one person trying to play three positions maybe two but ideally you want one person in one seat doing one job because they can then dedicate all their time effort and energy to that one and if you're on a budget the two that i personally combine is producer and mixer that's what roddy did with me um, and then, but I don't recommend mastering and mixing, uh, or also artist and producer, if you're an artist and then mixer and master engineer. Yeah. I, I myself have, have committed the hubris of mixing and mastering the same thing. And even I, you know, I thought I could overcome like the sage advice that I've been giving every, but no, nope, no, nope, it sounded like crap. It was terrible mixing wise and then and then also like there was this i was blurring the boundaries between you know what is like here's something in, in the mastering stage and then be like oh i'll go back and fix that in the mix and then the, it just becomes this big blob it, if i may give a tip um there has been a situation where i've had to songwrite produce mix and master a song and the way that i handled it was at every stage bounced out the stems and changed the color of my doll because then I was in a different, a different session. And, you know, when you're on a budget or when you're working and you're, it's just one or two people, you do what you have to do. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it does come down to like, you do what you have to do kind of mentality, you know, like see here at Peerless, this kind of represents the, like kind of the highest standard of, of what you can do. But, you know, again, like I said, I taught, mastering in using logic and you know isotope plugins and and also i love electronic music and you know that's just kind of how we roll you know it's it really 
it's 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 a different mentality um so let's see uh yeah it seems like a lot of you guys are D diy peeps love it um yeah like yeah if you heard me working on music in my in my bedroom it's like yeah, actually i would just be embarrassed uh, <laughs> <laughs> um what's the difference between, yeah producing and mixing um i think jalen i want you to take this one too because sure. yeah yeah you have um, to wear both of those hats yeah again with that with that basketball analogy uh sorry for everybody but the producer this is basically the producer basically runs the offense so it's like a coach effectively so um you're in charge of the executive decisions that are happening aside from the artist um, so with the producer's hat on, you could be producing a, you could be producing by making a beat. You could be sitting in the room telling somebody who is playing the drums, Hey, um, if you're telling them, Hey, if you, can you try playing with your heel down instead of up on the kick drum, this take. So you're really the, basically a creative director of the song. And then mixing is more actually executing the steps for um, a, like, I was gonna say from balancing, EQing, compressing, basically getting the song sounding uh, to a position where it can be mastered, which is the final product. So yeah. totally different, totally different role. Yeah, and then I would say like the mastering, you know, so mixing is all about balance, of course, and then the mastering kind of t like takes it to like a more finer tuned dimension it's it's really kind of all it's all kind of the same we all have the same goal um but we're kind of working at different resolutions like as far as like micro macro sort of mentality um so i guess so if you have like a one album like a concept album with wildly different styles in the songs uh, what's the main thing that should stay the same across all the tracks um, it's going to differ for everybody and it's also going to depend on the kind of music, but, uh, for us, for me, um, we usually try to keep, we like to try to match the vocal levels between the songs. So, you know, what's telling the story here? Um, if, if it's a song with a lot of, if it's a vocal album, uh, well, clearly the vocal is telling the story. Uh, if it was, uh, you know, if it was some electronic music or dance music, you know, you know, I would, you know, you focus on the groove, like that's telling the story. So then that's what we want to sort of work together. Um, Jalen, good starter headphones. I started producing at age 10. I scoured money from when I was like doing day labor jobs at Home Depot to go and buy my first uh, Skull Candy earbuds. So I'm dead serious. Skull Candy, whatever you can get your hands on is what you should start with. Um, I think that that teaches you a lot of things, honestly. Um, I don't know, like when people say starter headphones, there's like an implication because, you know, I I, I think that uh, starter kind of implies that it's not like a professional product. You can use whatever headphones you really need to. I know this is the old, the, this is like an old analogy, but Skrillex's Scary Monster Nice Sprites was mixed on, was mixed and produced on one KRK Rokit 5 that was blown out. So. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It's like, it's like the human ear. Sometimes <laughs> one is blown out. Uh, we compensate. <laughs> is there a little tinnitus joke? Oh, <laughs> Um, but that's also why we have the basketball team, you know, it's, it, it's, it's so that we can sort of normalize things, um, because everybody's perception is different. Um, you know, perception is reality. Reality is different for everyone. Um, but you know, there's also a, a medium, uh, a standard. Um, somebody asked about mastered for Apple music. What's the main thing done differently to songs mastered for Apple music? All right. That's like the secret stuff. <laughs> um, but actually, you know, um, uh, like it's kind of a proprietary thing. You know, Dolby has its Atmos thing. Uh, you know, so Master for Apple Music means uh, you can go to their website and find this as well. Um, but uh, we're 
certified as a mastered for iTunes um, studio. Uh, basically, so you can get a, a certification, and and basically you're just agreeing to adhere to their standards for submission. Um, and Spotify, Apple, um, you know, CD Baby, whatever, they, they're all a little different in terms of like the resolution or the amount of headroom they want. Um, so you know, Apple Music will want you know the highest resolution that we have. So I mean, everything 24 bit, of course, um, and then you know. We, They'll ask for a certain amount of headroom, and I think that is so. There's a lot of like secret proprietary stuff that we don't know, um, but that's so that they have the headroom to do their dynamics processing. Um, something important to note is, you know, anything you send to like Apple Music and like Spotify, especially, uh, they're gonna normalize it, um, and there there's actually like a website. Um, what's it called? that you can sort of listen to like how your mix might change um, once it's run through whatever their current algorithm is. Um, and there's some plugins. Um, one is the, the Ulean meter, which is uh, actually there's a free version where you can kind of like preview, you know, what things are going to sound like. Um, there are recommendations for loudness uh, in terms of the loudness units, luffs. Um, you know, try not to get too fixated on that when you're working, but uh, you know, it's it's something, you know, that also like I notice like record labels keep an eye on because they want to make sure that they, they hit that they hit that volume of, you know, of the genre so that, the, you know, the song will end up being featured in a playlist. Um, there's a lot of little things uh, at play. And on this end, it's really more about just like maintaining the highest quality at every stage. Um, so then because... <laughs> Frankly, it's just going to keep, it's going to get work from here on. It just starts to degrade <laughs> when it goes out into the world. So, <laughs> um, yeah, should we, should we do more or, uh, where, where are our hosts? Um, okay. Okay. One last question. Okay. Let's do, uh, from memory cell. Why are older popular albums remastered? For example, the Beatles, it sounded good before. Why do they remaster to match up how loud modern music is? <laughs> I love this question. Um, it's actually something that we've, we debate a lot at the Recording Academy. Um, so basically, the Beatles is an interesting example, too, because they actually have, they put out a version, was it Sgt. Pepper, I think, where they were actually remixed, and it was a little more modern sounding, and it, it was very divisive. Um, uh, there, but there are other things that, you know, that actually kind of make them, that we do to make it sound a little better. It, it really depends. Um, it really depends on your aesthetic. Uh, for, on our end, our historical album, our restoration work is basically about making it sound how it was meant to sound, uh, you know, in its original state. So before it got you know, layers and layers of age before like the tape started to shed before, you know, before there are pops and clicks uh, and, 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 and damage on the vinyl. Uh, sometimes the vinyl is the only source remaining. And so it's really about preserving history uh, when it when it comes to remastering pop stuff like that. Um, but, you know, there'll be things, you know, I. Yeah, yeah, I'm like listening to stuff from the 90s that's now remastered for now. And yeah, it is you know, to, I kind of like it. It's very divisive, um, but it's basically, a, you know, labels want things to stay current and in rotation. Um, and also, you know, if you have something like the Beatles, you, know, uh, you make, you, you put out a remaster, that's another, that's, <laughs> that's another set of revenue you're getting in there. Uh, the next year you put out a re-remaster, that's another, yeah, it's, yeah. These, some of these albums can can be cash cows for for decades <laughs> um, but yeah um, I actually have one right here that we did it's one of Jeff's I don't know if anyone's into indie music it's magnetic fields um, so he, he Jeff didn't talk about this but actually one of his first really big projects was he did on you know his old computer, old technology, and, you know, he was just starting out. 
So then uh, Merge Records wanted to put out a remastered version. Um, not, not because they didn't want to change the sound, but I think they just wanted to, you know, sort of freshen things up and bring it to a, you know, a, an audience that was not in the 90s. Um, and so we remastered it using our gear. Um, but, you know, honestly, the artists kind of prefer the original. So, <laughs> again, very divisive. Why 69? Uh, well, there are 69 of them, um, and there are 69 songs, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Oh, thanks, Dario. And yes, this is not a tattoo, it is a shirt. <laughs> um, cool. All right, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. This was really fun. Um, I think we should... I meant, let's, I'm going to type our email addresses in the chat if you have any more questions. Jalen, you can do yours because I'm not going to speak for you. Uh, I'll speak for Jeff at peerlessmastery.com. And yeah, and we're all on social media and Instagram and Facebook and stuff. So cool. Have a great day.